Thank you for the invitation. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. My name is Elizabeth Croft. I am the Dean of Engineering at Monash University. And as you can tell from my accent, I'm not around from around here. So if I'm not easy to understand, just let me know. I can slow down. So I'm going to speak to you about uh, robotics, but I'm going to speak to you about it from a question of looking at it from a, a humanities or a human focused point of view. Because I think as we think about robotics in the future, if we don't think about having people in the loop and people in the design, we have much to miss. So when I'm on the plane and people ask me what to do, I sometimes hesitate because when I say I do robotics research, it releases a lot of questions. And some of them are about the robots taking over the world. Will AI take our jobs? How will robotics affect our future life? Are they going to come to my house? Personally, I would like them, if they do, I would like them to do the dishes. So these are, these are questions, but one of the things that all of these questions uh, that people are asking are about how robotics will be in my life. How will I interact with them? How will they affect me? What is the future of human-robot interaction? And when we look at how we define a robot, many of the definitions relate to an interaction with people. The initial design or the initial thought of a robot by Carol Capek was an artificial worker, someone like a person or a serf. So not a fantastic uh, view, but a view that has a relationship uh, to people. So the noun, a machine that resembles a human and does tasks on command, uh, it, it relates to an automaton or a person who acts and responds in a mechanical routine manner. A machine or mechanical device that operates with human-like skill. So in all of our thinking and in all of our uh, public aspects of thinking about robotics, we have always imagined and thought about robots and people together. Yet today, our traditional robotics, the robotics that we see in our in, in workforces today are designed in cages. They are kept away from people for very good reasons because those things can kill you, okay? They move very, very quickly and they're not looking for you. They are only looking for the next uh, task that they will do as they go and do their automated work. They are designed for a non-human workspace. But our future robots, the robots that are in our labs and that we're thinking about right now, will be designed and are being designed for a human-friendly future. They are humanoid in shape and sometimes a little bit too humanoid in shape as we see with the, the robots that are developed by uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro. Many people, while they're well accepted and, and appreciated in some cultures, in many cultures they, they, they give this feeling of the uncanny valley that many people have talked about, that they're not quite right. But in any case, this future robotics needs to be and will be designed for collaboration in a human world. And we are coming to that point very, very quickly. The enabling technology for not only roboticists, people in labs, people in, in companies like uh, Google and others to develop robots, it's happening right now in you know, basements in, in schools, the technology to enable the development of robotics is exploding. Uh, rapid prototyping, you can go online right now and download the files to make your own robotic gripper with a, with a maker bot. You can do that. There is miniaturized sensing, not only the miniaturized visualization and auditory and sound generation, but tactile sensing is also becoming very much more available. So robotic skin is a thing that is coming uh, to a robot near you. The computational power, we already know how it is exploding, and that enables robots to be able to compute to sense and of 
of course, machine learning methods, uh, incorporating vision and other uh, memory and other pieces are being developed to allow robots and other autonomous devices to interact with our environment. We have a massive level of con connectivity that increases, that gives robots a view of the world that people do not have because they are able to gather and understand and utilize information much quicker than we can. And of course, a big piece is that robots can now be unplugged. They are not limited by their leashes anymore because we are increasing the availability of portable power. And that is actually one of the big limitations that we have faced uh, in the past. So at this point in time, what is the next step? And I would posit that the next step in robotics is where we start to focus on not just the capabilities, but the interaction and the design with people. And I, I posit that because uh, if we look, and this is a, an amusing look at why Asimov put the three laws in the order of robotics in the order that he did, is because if we don't, bad things happen. If we don't look at how people and robots will coexist, we can cause great problems. Rules of engagement with devices that are neither automatons, neither, you know, neither vending machines or machines that are limited in their ability to move around the world, but they are not people. They are in between. They are actually a new ontological category. We need new rules to understand how they interact, how we interact with them, and they how, and how they interact with our society. If my autonomous robot butler breaks your china, who is at fault? Right? So rules do matter. And in many cases, we can see that there were, are opportunities in, in cases where we have to think about our human ethics that underpin those rules. So we do have to make design decisions that incorporate the human in the loop. And when we think about the future of robotics, we are not only thinking about robots in factories, in manufacturing, but we are thinking about robots side by side with, with surgeons. We are thinking about robots that are sitting and ha uh, robotic arms that are, are enabling uh, people with disabilities, that are, are assisting in elder care, that are in our homes, and even, even a, a partner in childcare. These robots are coming to our homes, and the design in the loop uh, is very important. These are unstructured environments, unlike the environments where we have them now. They have many domains. We need to be thinking about safety, reliability, and very importantly, swappability. Because if your robot, if your nanny or your babysitter or your childcare isn't available, you can phone someone up and someone else can come. Your kid may not like that, but it is possible. But if you're, so how do you swap in robots who are doing childcare? Do you, are you able to bring in a different one? How does it happen? Can they be replaced, you know, in these, in these new jobs that we have, our new ontological category, how do we swap them in and back and forth for people? And most importantly, when we interact with robots, we need a common understanding of the rules of engagement, what the intent and goals are for the robot and the person so that we can work together well. So what does that mean? That means that when we are designing robots, we're actually starting to take um, our thinking and our design thinking from the social sciences, from the people that do design, from art and media, from, from human design, and, and not necessarily just from the mechanical engineers and the electrical engineers and the computer scientists. We need to use design methods that 
use human in the loop. And so we are looking at looking at human behavior, identifying the interaction, trying it out, and then putting it in the field. And in each step, there's a human looking at this and, and saying, is this the essence of the interaction that I want? So these methods have a personalized point of view. That is, user-centered really is personalized. And that means we need methods, not for big data, but for small data. And that is, I think, a different point of view than we see right now as we think about robotics. I would also like at this point, um, for those of you who want to contribute uh, to thinking about um, the ethics of robotics, uh, there is a group, and this is a plug for my former PhD student, who is now a professor at, uh, the, at McGill University. Uh, she and colleagues, lo uh, legal scholars and roboticists and ethicists, have something called the Open Roboethics Institute, where they are looking at exactly these questions, trying to resolve the social and ethical implications of robotics and A tech. AI technology. And they've recently released a framework that people can start looking at to think about how using AI in these applications will impact how you do the design in the first place. So starting at the very beginning. So what I want to do now in the last few minutes that I have is tell you a little story that illustrates how important it is to think about humans in the loop in a very simple example. And this example that I have is the task, the shared task of passing an object from one person to another. What does that look like when we do that with our robotic partner? So we started in this case, instead of thinking about a controller and thinking about the object and weighing the object and where it would go, we just took water bottles and we got people to hand them back and forth. And we looked at what they were doing while they were handing it back and forth. And what we saw is that people pretty much do one of two things. They either look at where they're going to put the bottle and the other person looks there, or they look at where they're gonna put the bottle and they look at you. I'm gonna give this to you. And we looked at all, all of that data, so we collected all these handovers, and we thought, okay, will that work? Will that human-centered way of designing a handover work for a person? So we gave it a try. We did a human-robot handover study where we invited 102, 102 participants to get a robot to give them a bottle of water. We had some data faults, so we did, were down to 96, and Fair enough, they were all first year university students on our open day at the university. We sucked them in before they knew anything. So they were naive subjects. And what their task was, was to retrieve a water bottle through a handover task from our robot, a PR2 robot is the name of the type of robot we had called the robot Charlie. So this is Charlie, and there were three conditions that we, we tried with Charlie. We tried, as I mentioned, the look at the object handover. We had tried to look at the object and then look at you. And we also tried, as a control condition, my favorite handover, which is the teenager handover. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. Uh, here is Charlie handing over the robot with the no gaze teenager handover. So basically looking down and handing over the bottle. This is Charlie handing over the bottle and looking at where he he or she is going to put it and then handing it over. And then the third uh, condition is the turn-taking condition where Charlie is, first of all, looking at where they're handing it over and then having a look at you. And in this video, which I hope will play, you can see what it looks like. So no gaze. As soon as the person reaches for it, we know because they're putting their hand across this light curtain here. And Charlie is just handing it over. 
there's a fair amount of uncertainty because they not they they think Charlie can see them and they're not understanding when when not looking what's going on. The shared attention goes very well. Charlie looks at the bottle. People take it. Say thank you. You're welcome. The turn taking is interesting because there's that look up at from them, which is very inviting. People really like that. And in, in all the um, ethnographic studies we did afterwards, um, we did find the following things. In terms of efficiency, engineering thinking, gaze had a big impact on efficiency of a handover, something that was very statistically significant. The most efficient way to hand over, for a robot to hand over the object, was for the robot to look at where it was handing it. And that went very quickly. We saw a significant launch, earlier launch time of the people into taking the object. And that has implications because even though the robot cannot see, the fact that the robot is looking at that object means that interaction will go quicker. But when we asked people what they liked and what they would want to use in the robot, it was the turn taking. It was the looking at the object and that in, then that invitation of looking at you. So what we learned from this is that we have to look at these factors, these human factors in our design so we can make decisions about whether we want efficiency or whether we want likability. But most importantly, what we learned is that it's very important to begin our research with a focus on people in the design of technology. Thank you very much.